Welcome everyone to another episode of Brown People Problems, where I, your host, Nikita, chat with my guests about some of our unique experiences and stories as a cultural group. And today with me, I have Sana Motlikar. She is a registered dietitian in Canada whose practice focuses on PCOS and weight loss. Uh, Sana, being a person of color herself, she wanted to fill this gap and really create a safe space of diverse cultural backgrounds so they can come in and they can achieve their health goals without feeling like it's only achievable if they give up their cultural foods. I love, I love that emphasis. Um, <laughs> her ultimate goal is to empower women of different, different ethnic and cultural backgrounds to take charge of their health while still enjoying the foods that they grew up eating. Welcome, Sana, to this episode. Thank you. Thank you for the intro. I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Um, How are you feeling about being on here today in our conversation? I'm excited, actually. Super excited. Um, I love your work. I've been following you for a while as well. And uh, again, the whole uh, psychotherapy aspect and then nutrition, there's such a uh, connection between the two. So yeah, I'm really Mm -hmm. glad to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for making time. Of course. Yeah. So Tell us a little bit more about how you started your practice as a dietitian with a focus on PCOS. You have your own yeah. virtual practice, right? Yes. I yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I went completely virtual when COVID hit. I was practicing mm. actually in person before, mm. um, but virtual practice has been great. I've been able to connect with clients literally so like all over Ontario. I'm also nice. registered in um, BC, so I have clients from mm. BC as well. So it's been it's been honestly fantastic. Um, how I got into PCOS, I mean, to be honest, like uh, when I started, um, university, I was doing my bachelor's in nutrition, then I moved into Mm -hmm. dietetics and during my education, um, I was visiting family in Kuwait. So right now I'm, I'm actually recording (laughs) this episode from, from Kuwait. My parents live here. And, um, I noticed my sister had like metformin, uh, prescribed to her. And Mm -hmm. I was, I think in my first year. I think first year of dietetics so Mm -hmm. we hadn't like touched on anything in my in my university It was just like basic stuff you know so i'm like Mm -hmm. oh why does a doctor recommend this to you blah 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 and she's like oh you know um i've got something called pcos and Mm -hmm. that's kind of what they've uh recommended and i'm like oh but this is a blood sugar sensitizer that's all i knew Mm -hmm. i had no idea (laughs) about pcos in general and so that kind of got me interested in learning mm. a little bit more because I remember like look, seeing some of her symptoms and not understanding. I'm like, she barely eats. Why? Like, you know, mm. she's, she was gaining weight at that time. And I was like so young at that point. Right. And so naive. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. So during my university, that's when I started to like focus a bit more on PCOS because our, our dietetic course is generalized. Mm. It's general in the sense that we get to learn a little bit about everything. So I did dialysis for a while i did a little bit of cancer i was in the cancer ward for some time um i did diabetes uh, education mm-hmm. so it's like a little bit of a variety right and we mm-hmm. never know everything going in or graduating we barely like just like the top <laughs> a little bit of what you know um mm-hmm. and so after i graduated i was like okay i think i'm like really interested in in this specific niche and i started mm-hmm. to sort of learn more about it and then even in terms of our ethnic group there is such a high prevalence of diabetes which Mm -hmm. also kind of connects into the pcos piece and i was like okay Mm -hmm. this is i think what i really enjoy um you know focusing on and that's Mm kind of how i fell into pcos yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i love that it (laughs) sounds like you really discovered um that in your years your early years right Uh, early years exactly like a lot of trial and error in their career absolutely absolutely like i remember when i was working um so after i graduated in uh 2013 so it's been a while um i came to kuwait and i worked here for three years in the bariatric uh area Mm. as well but that was like completely different field but there are so many overlaps in terms of you know the weight piece learning about Mm. skills and how to prepare proper meals uh, emotional eating tendencies. There's still some overlaps, but it wasn't like something I loved. Right now, mm. I feel like I can wake up and I'm like really excited to come to work every day. It's just mm. it's perfect. Like I could not have asked for a better um, niche and and field. Yeah, I think that's so gratifying, right? When you 100%. wake up excited, as opposed to feel like oh, I gotta drag my feet today. 
Oh my God, absolutely. When I was in clinical, that's how I felt. I was like, oh my God, I was so excited to, you know, be in dietetics and, you know, mm. like change people's lives and help them do better. And I'm like, this isn't it because clinical mm. is very different than private practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we only get like, a, you know, few minutes with the patient and we have like a very generic um, mm. education material that we go over with them. It's not even culturally uh, appropriate most of the time. It's very mm -hmm. general and yeah, it's mostly targeted for the white population. So it's not culturally appropriate education material to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that culturally appropriate piece, <clears throat> you know, I've found that has always been missing from mm. the general field of nutrition um, and like dietitian services and things like that. I've never availed those services myself, but I've always thought about it, that it always felt like that cultural appropriate piece has been missing. And yeah. you're really filling that gap. Yeah, it honestly, even when I started, I remember feeling like, honestly, I think I was probably brainwashed to a certain extent too, thinking that, oh, mm -hmm. this is what I've been taught, right? So your food needs to look a specific way. And mm -hmm. then when I sort of like started making, like, start, uh, so a lot of my friends come from different cultural backgrounds and I feel like I learned more from them in terms of, diverse foods and mm -hmm. you know like i just learned so much more about the cultural piece from just engaging with different people mm -hmm. um that was that was really lacking because we don't get taught yeah. about okay what is like a middle eastern diet looks like or what does the mm -hmm. persian diet look like what does an indian diet look like we don't focus on those things mm -hmm. in in medical niche therapy we don't so I think I, I took what I learned from like my school and my like university, learned from my personal experiences mm -hmm. through, you know, interaction with like friends and then sort of like put that together. And it's it's been really useful for me. Like, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate that because I know when I've spoken to people in my personal life about accessing similar services, there's always this mm. hesitancy, right? Because there's this general belief that, well, I'm going to, it's not going to fit into my cultural lifestyle and I'm going to have to give up a lot of what I yeah. eat and like drastically do a total yeah. overhaul of what I eat. Honestly, absolutely. And I am noticing a slight improvement in that where mm. people are starting to be more aware because when clients apply for working with me, they usually make a note of that. They're like, you know, we really want to learn how to eat our culture diet. And I'm like, yay, you win. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So that's really cool because I think people are finally starting to see. I know there's, there's a long way to go, but it's a start. You know, people are accepting that. You know what? I think I can still eat my cultural food and and improve my health outcomes. Because a lot of times what happens is they are trying these drastic changes and it's so different from the way they live. So different. Mm. We are going to go back to our default setting. Like that's just how we're wired. And so we feel this like, oh, I was so on track before. And now I'm like completely off track. Why? Because we're eating our cultural food. Absolutely not. So it's a lot of like mindset shift that mm. needs to also change uh, when someone's sort of like starting to take their health seriously and start mm. that health journey. Yeah. And I, I like how you said that we'll default right to our natural setting. That makes a lot of sense. 100%. Because uh, any type of change, if it's too drastic, if it's too yeah. much of a shift right away, it doesn't feel sustainable, right? Or if it feels like yeah. it's depriving you of something. And, you know, like our culture, generally South Asian culture, like our culture is really based around a lot of food. Like food is part of every celebration. Food, yep. food is part of every mood. And to distance yourself from something that is so central to who you are, and our identity, that can feel like a huge loss. It is a loss, isn't it? That's a nice way to, to put it because you feel like you got to give that up and kind of like mourn that phase and be like, oh, let's just, you know, mm -hmm. grieve this and then let's try like fit into this different, um, yeah, like different uh, way of living, which you've never like done, but you feel like that's the only way you can get to your goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So. Can you share a little bit about how exactly diet and nutrition matters in our overall quality of life? I think our, oh my our gosh. listeners, yes. really, and I know it's a really broad topic. But it's a, it's a broad topic, to but that. yeah, yeah, that is quite broad. Yeah. But to be honest, um, when I think of like 
nutrition, it's almost a form of self care as well. It's、mm-hmm. like, okay, how do you care for yourself? Like, that's a big piece in my head, or that's how I like to kind of、uh, make connect the dots for my clients. And I'm like, so for, for them to when they're making changes and stuff like that.、Um, so that's like a big piece. And when we stop like caring for ourselves, that can have Negative impacts on our energy levels, for example, right? So, when we are not eating in a way we should be, especially related to our blood sugars, we can feel these highs and lows. And especially when the rates of anxiety, depression go high, when our blood sugars are going out of whack too, we can actually exaggerate that, that feeling of that low, right? So, when we have these highs and then we get a crash, we can actually feel like, wow, this like almost like a depressive episode sometimes, or it can exaggerate that feeling. So that's like one big thing in terms of like why diet can be really important just for our mood.、Um, even brain function. So, if we're trying to like, you know, be CEOs and run our own companies, or we are going to our nine to five jobs, or we're moms running after our toddlers, or, you know, there's just like lots to do. If we can't function properly, right? That's that can also be、mm. that can, that's also being taken away from like your quality of life because you're not like working at your best level, no matter what that is. Same connects back to your energy levels. If you're you're constantly tired, how are you going to be running behind your kid? Or how do you take them to like your soccer your soccer practice?、Mm. How do you get through all your meetings? Are you going to get that three p.m. slump in the、mm. afternoons and feel like oh my god, I'm totally crashing? Um, so there's like a lot of connection, and even in terms of like our brain function, our brain uses so much carbs. Like literally, our main source of fuel is carbohydrate, and then we go on these really restrictive diets. It's almost like punishing our ourselves and restricting、mm-hmm. our brain from like the preferred fuel, with which is glucose.、Mm-hmm. And then we're like, we, I mean, for short term, I'm sure about like our body is good and it adapts. Like for example, when we're on keto and stuff, yes.、Mm-hmm. It adapts, but that's not how our body is meant to function,、mm. right? So that's a big one.、Um, what else?、Uh, I mentioned like the mood piece as well. So yeah, there's yeah. Just, there's a lot. That makes a lot of sense, and I'm reflecting on sort of my daily practice in my life as you're、yeah. talking, and I then that makes a lot of sense, right? If we are Hungry, it affects our mood, right? If we feel like we've had a really big meal that's not maybe balanced in proteins、like、and carbs, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it does impact our nervous system, right? Oh、and、yeah, our, it does absolutely. Yeah,、mm-hmm. and our mood is a hundred percent tied, right, to to how we're feeling, how we're functioning, how we see the world, how we see ourselves, and so I think you're right that it's such a big part of our mental health. Yeah. It, it definitely is, and I like what you mentioned about the nervous system. Same thing with blood sugars. How we keep our blood sugars also affects our our nervous system.、Mm. Um, so I think people only look at nutrition as oh, it's just for weight loss or numbers、mm. on the scale or like an appearance thing. But there's so much going internally that nutrition、yeah. plays a huge role in. Even like the the brain function, like prevention of Alzheimer's, dementia, things like that.、Mm. You need a, a good quality diet in your early like twenties and thirties for it to,、mm. <coughs> sorry, to work in like your older age. You know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I think whenever we're kind of looking at the body or the health, the physical health, the mental health, I think we can start to really compartmentalize. You know,、mm-hmm. as like. Self care, just being maybe about skincare, or self care, just being about going to the gym, or self care being just about going to therapy, or journaling, or doing meditation. But I think what I'm really hearing from you is we gotta take a step back, zoom out,、mm-hmm. and see the body as a whole, right? That absolutely and how that yeah interacting. Hundred percent, absolutely.、Um, even in terms of,、um, I think when we are. Skipping meals because we live like a really fast-paced life, and we're like,、mm. oh my god, I have so much on my list. I gotta complete all of that, and then、yeah. we just like put ourselves last. That、mm. there's something in in that too when we constantly keep rejecting ourselves, and I'm sure you can potentially talk、mm. a little bit more on on that topic. But when we constantly just push put ourselves last, and then、mm. everything else comes first. That starts to change a lot of things internally, even including our hormones.、Um, there is a connection、mm. there. For sure,、um, do you have any thoughts on that? 
Yeah. You know, as you were talking about the self-sacrifice piece, I was thinking of, <laughs> right, I was thinking of all of like the, the South Asian mums and the aunts and everyone <laughs> in you, just sort of this like cultural norm around yes. the mums eating last. And yes. right, or them serving everyone first or taking care of everyone first. And um, I think growing up, I don't think I've seen I don't have many memories of actually sitting with my mom on the dining table and yes. eating. Right. I think that is so embedded in our culture and just what we kind of expect from a woman. Yeah, that's the and, norm. And girls. Yeah, that's the norm, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that yeah. self-sacrifice, right, is so socially rewarded. And mm -hmm. that just goes to show that it can have such a profound impact on your nervous system and your hormones. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't think um, we realize that till it's really too, too late. And then mm -hmm. we're trying to like fix things, which again is like, you know, uh, we're not really taught how to take care of ourselves or look into whole, the whole preventative approach versus like, oh, let's just fix the problem, but not why don't we prevent it? Why don't we all set up some good habits earlier on that can set us up for the long run, right? Yeah, and I think, and I hate making generalizations, but yeah, I think generally us as a mm -hmm. cultural group, we are a lot more reactive about our health than we are proactive. And we know a lot <laughs> of that goes back to like colonial trauma and yes. all of that uh, stuff. But I think now obviously like a shift is happening, but that's a general trend, isn't it? Yeah. Well, when I yeah. am having a heart attack, then I'm going to get invested in my cardiac health, but not before that. Yeah. And then again, at that point itself, it's extreme drastic changes, yeah. which again, then hard to sustain. And then we go back to that square one piece, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. So I, I'm really getting the sense that with your whole focus on inclusivity of uh, ethnic foods, cultural foods, I think you're really kind of empowering people that you work with to create a balance and practice self-care through nutrition. Absolutely. Absolutely. I find like the biggest trend I see with clients when we first onboard is the whole skipping meals and not making time for themselves. Like that's like a yeah. big one. And yeah. rather than, rather than focusing on calories or, you know, this is the only amount of carbs you can eat and all that stuff. We actually just focus on just the basic skills like, okay, can we prepare meals or even set up a reminder on your phone? Mm -hmm. Because you're not, you're not in tuned yet with your body, right? Because you're so disconnected from the body and you're so like out there into your work or, you know, just catering to other people. Can we set up like reminders mm -hmm. on your phone to be like, okay, 12 o'clock, 1230, one o'clock, whatever that might be you need to take a quick break come like leave your workspace eat come back and you will realize that you will get your work done or you will be able to kind of complete the tasks you had um just because we're so like wired in a sense that that urgency that oh my god i have to finish this right now um mm -hmm. again that go 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 it, it's not helpful for hormones at all uh that's more damaging than actually eating mcdonald's <laughs> occasionally <laughs> if you want you know what i mean yeah. like i'm like please go eat McDonald's, but please eat lunch more often, you know? Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. I'm just thinking about how I'm so bad <laughs> with my meals. I'm always skipping meals. Um, I think too, a lot of us, a lot of women, maybe a lot of brown women, I think we also carry a lot of mental load for what like needs to be done mm. during the day. And I don't know if you experience this or for other people listening to this experience this, but I find that from when I wake up in the morning, I'm already thinking about food, but not in the sense of, you know, I need to eat, I'm hungry, but in the sense of, okay, like, what do we need to make for lunch? What do we need to make for dinner? Okay, like, what, what needs to go in the grocery cart? Um, I order my groceries online. So, you know, what needs to go in my yes, grocery cart? What's missing? So I feel like there's this constant mental load that almost takes away from... The pleasure. The okay. pleasure, yeah, and, and the appetite, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think what, here's the thing, it sounds like, very, like chaos, right? Like we're yeah. constantly like having to plan our one meal, then we have to plan our next meal, then we have to like figure out what 
our kids want to eat, then we want to figure mm-hmm. out, oh, what else is coming up this week? So yes, you are right in the sense that we are overloaded with like lots of decisions and that mm-hmm. there is something called as decision fatigue, right? Like we get mm-hmm. so tired just making decisions and then we're like, it's just easier to like skip the damn meal than like worry about yeah. what I want to eat, right? Yeah. So obviously that comes with just building your systems at home and creating better like like just being better organized and knowing that okay these are some go-to meals that worked for me and my family and just sort of like starting and then building off that mm-hmm. versus making really elaborate things and being in the kitchen for so many hours meal prepping on a Sunday none of my clients meal prep none mm-hmm. none of them they do very mm-hmm. like small things here and there during the week and maybe on a Sunday they'll like cook just proteins and that and then we t- I teach them how to like mix and match those but we don't do elaborate massive meals mm. at the beginning we just need to get through and learn how to make satisfying meals which take 15 20 minutes tops mm. and then when you start to build that confidence because that's mm. lacking we're lacking that confidence in ourselves right so we feel overwhelmed we're like i don't know how this oh my god like mm. the only meals we know is like making these like one hour dishes and things like that but really there's so many things we can do also in our cultural diet that don't require mm. excessive chopping excessive prepping things like mm. that so once we start taking the load off us take again take a step back try to start off with like one or two simple strategies simple meals and then build off it mm. versus just trying to do like everything all at once and especially if we don't have direction and we don't have like we're not I guess we don't have like a perfect formula of how to do meals. It can sound very chaotic. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and if speaking from my personal experience, it's even put me off of a lot of my cultural foods. You know, it's I it, the way it seems to me is oh, it's just so much easier to, you know, whip up a pasta and <laughs> versus you know, sit there and decide to make a dal. It just seems yeah. like a lot of work and I wonder if that's a trend that you notice in your work too with people. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, because I would say like 90, maybe over 90% of my clientele are South Asians and then mm-hmm. the remaining are like Middle Eastern and um mm-hmm. Persian like that or oh, even um Hispanic. I work with a lot mm-hmm. of like Mexicans and things like that too. Um but I the food piece I think again there are so many little hacks that we mm. we can work on like especially with like dal a lot of my clients would just cook their dal just dal itself they're not doing the tarka or nothing they just cook right. their dal and freeze it and then mm. when they're ready to kind of put a meal together all they're doing is the little tar- the tarka right on top right. yeah so there are like of course this again goes back to skills Mm. Right, you just need the right skills and you need to practice those skills till it becomes like, oh my god, so easy. Like I'm going to I'm watching like Netflix right now, but I'm just going to cook my dal and then just yeah. freeze it. So it's just yeah. like looking at your whole day and seeing, okay, where realistically where do I have like little chunks of time? Mm. Do I have 15 minutes here? Do I have 15 minutes here? Do I And then just like doing little things at that point. Like if you have 15 minutes, you're like, "Oh, I know at night I need onions for my dinner. So okay, let's just chop up the onion and keep it in the fridge. Like just doing little things versus like having to do everything at that one go. For me, just the sound of it actually stresses me out. Like that gives me anxiety. Major anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine too figuring out that little system can be really system, empowering yeah. too for someone, right? It can be really empowering. Yeah. And it's also a way to regulate their stress and anxiety. Absolutely. because i remember like especially clients who come to me with like pcos they're already dealing with so much they're already dealing with so much stuff so many symptoms mm. low energy like fatigue is like a big thing it's really hard for them to even like go and exercise and things like that right and then how are you expecting them to you know meal prep and then go work mm. out and things like that it makes no sense so we kind of really need to simplify things once they start to simplify their their routine itself they start to feel a lot better because now we're not like focusing on oh perfect meals three day like three times mm. uh, a day breakfast lunch dinner focus on all three meals i have to make sure my snacks perfect no we're like focusing on like maybe one thing you might focus on just getting organized with breakfast and then we don't mm. even touch we don't even talk about lunches and dinners till they've developed that one skill they practice 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 that's mm. also helping their brain rewire right mm-hmm. now they're making a new connection in their brain 
they're looking at that as not stressful anymore because now they've had enough practice their brain has adapted versus yeah. doing like 20 new things all up or get someone giving them a meal plan and be like hey do this on monday do this it doesn't mm-hmm. work like that life is just very unpredictable different things come up and then we can kind of feel like oh my god now i don't know what to do and we can kind of like freeze right mm-hmm. so yeah just simple strategies is is definitely the way to go yeah i imagine too i think those of us with a more of a chaos right in our lives mm. especially those diagnosed with pcos can experience a lot of emotional chaos right in their lives and yes i think when we experience this emotional chaos we want to create really rigid structures for ourselves which i think only perpetuates that state of chaos <laughs> right yes <laughs> yeah. absolutely yeah so i like how absolutely. you said that it's about being flexible and not trying to introduce more and more and more that i can do but to find yeah, one change less. yeah yeah, yeah absolutely. simplify sometimes simplify less is more process. absolutely mm. less and less and less like try to like reduce the load off yourself and then see how you feel then add another and so on right mm. um nobody can can do it all and i think i don't know we we assume that we should be able to i I'm not sure where that standard has come from but we mm-hmm. feel like oh we have to be perfect like mm-hmm. that perfection culture is yeah just not helpful yeah and it shows up in self care it shows up in eating it shows up in every aspect of how we live our lives yeah 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 no for sure yeah uh, given that you have such a big focus on PCOS in your practice i'm really curious about um the prevalence of PCOS in South Asian communities and i wonder mm. if you have any stats on Got that on. off the top of your head or just maybe some yeah. anecdotal kind of stats in in your experience yeah. because i'm finding more and more women now are being diagnosed or having PCOS like yeah. symptoms um, yeah and that goes hand in hand with a lot of like specific mental health concerns, a lot of like mood dysregulation and things like yeah. that. So I wonder if you have any anything on that. Yeah, to be honest, like with stats, I I don't have like any specific numbers, but I do know like in general like with women, like 1 in 10 are typically mm. diagnosed with PCOS. And then I think in in India specifically, there's a um one of the states which is Maharashtra I think they have like a little over 20% prevalence of PCOS wow. um and again they don't again we are limited to having proper data collection right. so we don't have that but just again in my practice I'm a I'm a full practice okay my practice is absolutely full and all of my clients are south asian yeah or as i said like over 90% that's a huge uh percentage just for my practice so i can only yeah. imagine um people in like yeah different practices so yeah. i do see that a lot i don't know if it's maybe they're starting to get uh diagnosed properly now then oh. back in the days when diagnosis was just very hard like there are people in their 40s and they're like well it took me like 8 to 10 years to get a proper mm. diagnosis for PCOS um they go to their doctors with symptoms like oh you know have facial hair have chin hair and things like that like oh yeah you know it's common with your ethnicity or oh. it's normal so they just get like whatever brushed off but yes we generally have a little bit more body hair and things like that yeah. but you know you want to look into other symptoms too rather than be like oh just lose weight or oh you just mm. it's part of like your ethnicity it's it's fine so maybe also a lot of people are now getting diagnosed yeah maybe and they have a lot more research or even like so dietitians like myself there are other healthcare professionals we're also sort of like putting out so much more content out there so mm. i think people are recognizing and then taking that information to their doctors and be like what about this like does this make sense and then they're able to kind of advocate for themselves like that's a huge thing that's th- there's a little bit of shift there where people are now starting to advocate for themselves mm-hmm. and not just be like okay we're not going to do any more testing or this or that and just brush uh patients mm-hmm. off yeah mm-hmm. yeah in my work with clients as well i have found that those with 
huge waves of emotion dysregulation um, mm -hmm. are showing some PCOS like symptoms and obviously I'm not a medical doctor but I mm -hmm. encourage them to connect with their GP Someone, to explore yeah. right and it's not necessarily to get a diagnosis per se but just absolutely or and look at this again Lord. mental mm -hmm. health piece from a holistic approach right so it's not just okay me coming to therapy or me learning emotion regulation skills is going to help me but what changes do i need to make in my diet what changes do i need to make in like my vitamins what changes do i need to make do i need to work with a um, um a trainer right so i think it's about looking at like the bigger picture yeah and you know how you mentioned about you seeing so many um clients and noticing that you know what there is like some connection they're seeing similar symptoms like mm -hmm. pcos it's actually a thing. I've also noticed the same trend in my personal, in my practice. You won't find this on Google. Like I can't sit there Googling like, oh, overthinkers, PCOS, this, that, like mm. I, I can't do that. But I've picked this up as just from all the women I've worked with and this very specific pattern where again, women who are overthinkers or they feel like they're constantly switched on and there's like no shutting off, they do see more signs of elevated DHEAS, which is like a androgen, a male hormone. It's mm. different than the testosterone because your DHEAS is made specifically from your adrenals. Whereas your testosterone, mm. yes, a little percentage comes from uh, your adrenals, but a lot of that can also be produced from your ovaries that, mm. you know, when your insulin is, your body's making a lot more insulin, then yes, your ovaries will produce that little bit of testosterone. Sure. So that's a little bit diet related. But then mm. there's a whole different side of PCOS where it's specifically nervous system regulation that works to help bring down mm -hmm. these levels mm -hmm. and starting to kind of like work on our thought process. I was an overthinker, 100%. Mm. I've, I've like spent my whole like life being an overthinker. I think only in the past two years, I it's like managed really well. And the way it mm -hmm. kind of came about for me was when I started uh, looking into nervous system regulation, I started looking into yin yoga specifically, and that mm -hmm. yin yoga is specific to nervous system. Mm -hmm. And that started to kind of relieve a lot of my symptoms. And I'm not I'm not able to be diagnosed as a PCOS. Um, uh, like I can't get diagnosed with PCOS, because you need like two out of the three criteria, I only fit one, which is mm -hmm. again, the adrenal based. Wow. Exactly. So there are people who don't even don't have PCOS, but it can still mm. you can still have similar symptoms where you might like start to lose your hair, you might have like little facial hair, all to do with elevated androgens because you're overstimulating your adrenals. So it's like yeah. go 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 or survival, right? Mm. Like I've always been that person, and I had to mm. make so much shift in in that where I'm like always like move countries. I've had to like live overseas for so many years by myself like i've always kind of like been that person and then finally i'm like taking a step back in the last two years and i'm like okay let's learn to ground ourselves and not constantly want to flee every yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> no that itself was a huge shift for me yeah it's i think just the simple thing yeah you really hit the nail on the head i think us as a cultural group we are always in survival <laughs> mode always yeah Right. All of us. We're yeah. just constantly running for whatever this carrot that's being dangled in front of us. It constantly keeps moving further and further mm -hmm. out of our reach. And absolutely. You know, again, all of it comes from like this intergenerational trauma piece, right? But I think our absolutely. nervous systems are constantly in a place mm -hmm. of like fight or flight. And it's cur I'm, I'm curious, do you do a lot of polyvagal work with your clients when you educate them so, about the nervous system? Yeah, so I talk, I first of all, I sort of explain the two nervous systems, right? Like your sympathetic, parasympathetic, understand like, okay, what the two parts do? How can we engage our uh, parasympathetic more? Because we're constantly mm -hmm. in our sympathetic right like mm -hmm. and it's not bad i don't want people to feel like oh my god sympathetic right it's not bad yeah. we get stuff done we you yeah. know we achieve things and whatnot but we need to make sure there's not like a a shift in balance where we're just overstimulating this part so most of my work is more to do with like working on breath like breathing techniques um using your body to sort of calm your nervous system so that i pull in like the yin yoga um mm. therapy from in that which honestly it's like most of the um i guess recommendations i give to my clients is never like oh go into a 60 minute yoga because 
you know, that will be great for your nervous system. I mean, I'm realistic. We don't have that much time and we need like quick little hacks. So most of the recommendations are like a two minute exercise or a three minute breathing work or maybe just sitting in child's pose or just having your legs up the wall. So I give them a lot of like little, little tools and their little toolkit, mm -hmm. right? I always ask them too. I'm like, hey, have you worked with a psychotherapist? I, as soon as I sort of like suspect that, okay, there's a little bit more of the nervous systems part. I'm like, it also helps working with a psychotherapist because you build so much skills and like your thought process as well, like improvement in how you, you process information, how you process the situation. It's like just mm. wearing a different lens and seeing, okay, this is not too bad. Like I can, I can manage this and not feel like, oh my God, I need to like, run or I need to freeze or things like that yeah. so definitely I always collaborate and so the work I give them is more to do with like little, little exercises in mm. their toolkit and then they also have to work with a um, psychotherapist for sure mm. yeah I really love that <clears throat> making it <clears throat> excuse me making it approachable making it doable instead of doable you know yeah. saying okay well you gotta go to orange theory three times a week and you know that just sounds like such an overwhelming change. Um, yeah. I think a lot of my clients are surprised sometimes where I'm like, we're not going to talk about exercise at all, actually, because we, we don't use exercise for weight loss at um, all. We have goals like movement goals. Like, okay, how many steps do you get in a day? All right, let's try to increase that. And that's it. And honestly, I, I do share a lot of my clients' progresses online. And that's all done through that same method. None of my clients are sort of like over-exercisers or like, focusing on you know yeah. doing a lot of like intensive workouts we actually do a lot more gentle gentle movement gentle yeah. um nutrition as well it's gentle nutrition it's not like oh yeah rigid right it's like let's mm. flow with it yeah yeah because especially when we're talking about nervous system regulation <laughs> any type of regulation exercise has to be yeah. gentle right it can't yeah. be a big shift that okay go do yeah. like a 60 minute hit workout that will only just dysregulate us more. absolutely absolutely for yeah. sure i think um i know people talk about like high intensity workouts and things like that so a lot of my adrenal based pcos clients yeah. i don't recommend that at the beginning but i also have to let them know that that's not something that that will never work for you it's it's mm -hmm. not like that it's just your nervous system just can't handle that for it for the time being because you still need to expand your bandwidth mm -hmm. you still need to kind of reg learn how to regulate your nervous system and then yeah if you want to go do a hit workout i promise you you come out of that class you'll feel good you're not going to feel drained right that i've seen yes. that shift also happening once they've got the, your whole nervous system sort of nice and you know engaged mm. and balanced versus like the this um but yeah hit yeah. work it's not bad there's a lot of other benefits to it but just not for people who are haven't done the the, the foundation work on mm. themselves first yeah that's really interesting because i experienced i was a <clears throat> huge orange theory fan three times a week i was there and it was helpful in the sense i you know started to run and i became a runner i couldn't run more than two minutes and now i could do 20 20 minutes so nonstop. Cool. Nice. yeah and it was really beneficial but what i noticed was every time i left the studio mm -hmm. i had this huge crash mm -hmm. i wanted to curl up on my bed and, just and chill sleep in bed. Yep or just yeah. sleep sleep at 11 o'clock in the morning right like i felt so yeah. drained and so crashed i was like okay well this is not how workouts are supposed to feel it no, should not absolutely. be draining and i think i did like my own work and a lot of reflecting and i think it was helpful for me to realize okay i need to go towards something that's a little bit more gentler so maybe that looks like a brisk walk or maybe that looks like like a 15 yes. minute like light yoga movement something instead of like something that. that is so overly stimulating for the nervous system hundred percent i think also what you mentioned that you know you're reflective i feel like that is such an important piece in your health journey is learning to consistently reflect and be like hmm, what's working mm -hmm. what's not working how am i feeling do i need to make any adjustments versus just like blindly following even a dietitian like always tell my clients if i'm giving you a recommendation i mm -hmm. still want you to come back with information for me and give me feedback because I am not like, I'm not the, you know, um, I'm not responsible for your body. You are responsible for your body mm -hmm. and how you feel, right? So I can just like sort of give you options and guide you, but really you are the one driving this whole thing here, mm -hmm. right? 
So if you don't reflect, you're just gonna be like, yeah, my dietitian told me to do this. I'll just do that.、Mm. Yeah. But what if you don't feel good or it's not working with your lifestyle? You shouldn't do it. Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. Reflection is a huge part of this. It, it really makes me think about how,、um, again, you know, as a cultural group, we tend to put a lot of stock in what the doctor is saying, right?、Oh、and what、God. the health the power is saying, giving the power away. Yeah, giving the power away exactly. And I don't know. Have you have you noticed that in your work with with your South Asian clients or just like minority clients that there can be this?、Um, They're just handing over what they're feeling to you and saying, "Okay, Sana, like fix this or whatever you say is like gospel," and <laughs> they like implement it, no questions asked. There's so much of that, like collaboration piece. Yeah, I I I know that already in terms of like even in our、um, with like a, the patient and、uh, doctor relationship, like I'm well aware of that piece yeah. already. Yeah. I've seen that happen. With my family, with like you know your friends and things like that. So I'm like I'm highly aware about of that. So when I approach my clients too, I sort of give them a little spiel before. I'm like, okay,、mm. it needs to be collaborative. That's why if I give you recommendations, you try it. You let me know、mm. if this works. Come back, give me feedback. We play around with it. See if it you know is enjoyable to you too. It has to be enjoyable.、Um, even when clients start off with me, sometimes they feel like they can't actually go and eat. Junk food sometimes, like going to McDonald's and just having like a burger.、Mm. I actually focus on that. I'm like, we need to make sure there's fun meals coming into your diet、mm. at least two times a week. So I don't want your diet to look perfect. Because when I'm reviewing the journals, I'm like, so like, have you explored other、mm. foods like that you used to enjoy before? Because you don't want to just like completely eliminate them. You want to be able to live a life where you know now you have the right skills to put healthy lunches and. Well-balanced meals together, but you also have the right skills of like listening to yourself. Like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna make a decision of like Friday evenings. I'm gonna go and eat McDonald's. Or I'm gonna go eat out with my friends. Like, actually plan for those. There's nothing wrong with you planning、mm. for a fun meal. It's actually、mm. good for our soul and our mental health.、Mm. Yes, it may not be the most nutrient dense meal, but that's like 20% of what you're doing. 80% of the time. You're eating good quality, nutrient dense foods. That matters more.、Mm. And I feel like the the fun foods or the the going out piece, going out with your friends, family to eat out, it honestly does so much for our soul. Does、yeah. so much for our mental health. And when you start to learn that, it's freeing. There's like freedom in this approach. So you don't、mm. feel like I'm really on a diet because even after clients graduate off my program. I'm like, this is life now for you, right? Like, this is it. Like, you're just、mm. gonna keep going. There's nothing else you need to do. You're just kind of living life. Of course, you may want to fine tune. You know, if there's a new circumstances coming up, maybe now suddenly your work hours are shifting.、Mm. Then we again, like, you know, figure out okay, what needs to change. So I've given them enough skills to kind of like be their own nutritionist or dietitian. Like, they have the right skills to do that work for themselves. They don't have to constantly、yeah. be working. With someone, so I teach them all the backend stuff,、mm. all about like label reading, understanding different carbs, understanding,、um, mm. you know, how to work on your gut health. Of course, the nervous system piece. So I literally talk about just graduating from my program and then just being independent.、Yeah. And of course, if they need to touch base, they they touch base with me once every six weeks, one every eight weeks. Some clients are like pretty good on their own, and that's the that's the goal, right? Like you don't、mm. want to keep. Coming back and、um, having to ask someone else to tell you what to do、mm-hmm. doesn't sit well with me as well, right? I'm like, <laughs> you need to、yeah. be able to decide for yourself, and that's where the confidence piece comes in with nutrition. Because people lack that confidence, they just rely、mm-hmm. on people giving them those template meal plans and like, here, eat this, eat that, eat this, eat that. No,、mm-hmm. you decide. Once you decide, you build that confidence. You can go anywhere in the world or eat in different cultural. Um, like eat different cultural meals and be able to still figure out how to plate it based on、mm. your meal composition. Yeah,、mm-hmm. yeah. I imagine that is so freeing and、uh, so empowering, right, for a lot of your clients and also just in general for brown women. It sounds like you're also kind of teaching、yeah. them to pay attention to themselves. To become、yes. regulated and attuned to themselves. Okay, I'm really good at taking care of everyone else. Yeah, and I think 
this burden that we put on brown women to be self-sacrificers and people pleasers i think it's maybe not all 100 percent a bad thing that it leaves you with There's some yes yeah you you're very perceptive right it makes you very empathic it makes you very compassionate but we just forget to turn inwards and give that to ourselves and it sounds like you're really teaching them to turn inwards and yeah. pay attention to their own process yeah it's hard to do that sometimes when you've been doing that since you were a kid yeah. essentially right yeah. um but i always sort of like tell them in terms of okay if you want to show up as a better partner you want to show up as a better mother or you want to show up as a better friend or you want to show up better at your work it all starts with you first so when you start putting in it's not like you're taking or stealing time away from your partner or stealing away time from your kid or anything yeah. it's like you first invest invest in yourself when you feel good you are going to show up so much better just mm. out in the world show up better so it's good for you in every area it doesn't mean that you're like you're not a good partner or not a good mother or anything right so that yeah. typically resonates with a lot of women they're like Okay, I mean that sounds good, but again, they need to practice cuz just saying mm. it, yes, it resonates, but unless you actually do many 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 habits, like for example, you know, being like, okay, I'm going to make sure I take time out for my lunch and not skip it mm. or okay, I'll get help, ask for help from your partner, like mm. if you communicate, they can help you with little things and that doesn't mean that you're like burdened with doing everything and that way you can actually sit down and eat a meal with the mm. family or whatever that looks like right like there's so many so many examples but yeah also asking yeah. for help is a big big thing yeah yeah and i think also yeah. feeling safe enough to ask for help right i think it's helpful to yeah. yeah reflect a little bit on um like what is my value system looking like too because i think a lot of us put a lot of pressure on ourselves to fulfill these roles perfectly so mm. i have to be the perfect yeah. partner i have to be the perfect daughter i have to be the perfect daughter in law i have to be the perfect this the perfect that and i think mm. just taking a step back and seeing okay how much pressure and yeah i exist in my external environment but how much pressure am i putting on myself to fulfill these roles and is that really sustainable for me or is that holding me back yeah i wonder also i i mean i'm no expert but I, I wonder if it's also like the we put our self worth in all these other forms, yeah. where yeah. we feel like oh we're going to be worthy if I'm mm. like a good partner or a better mother and stuff like that. But again, mm. we kind of like need to shift how we view that, and yeah, it, it's just yeah. it's so complex, right? Oh, <laughs> it's so much it's so yeah. so so complex and it's yeah. really nuanced and mm -hmm. i know we can keep talking about this for days and days <laughs> and days but would you have any um resources for our listeners who maybe want to learn a little bit more about how your blood sugar impacts your mood or how the nervous system is impacted by nutrition just some resources that we can link below yeah, I mean, I don't have anything on top of my head, but I do post a lot around like blood sugars on my Instagram yeah. anyway. Uh, that's one place. Um, there is, oh, I can actually even link you to another, um, I think she's a researcher uh, called the Glucose Goddess when she talks oh, a lot about blood sugar balances. Uh, very easy, simple strategies that she also uh, shares on her social media, which mm. I think is pretty cool. Um, and then anything related to like, or cultural food things like that how to plate i give a lot of different examples on on my social mm -hmm. media as well on instagram um yeah that's probably a good starting point yeah i'll definitely link your instagram below i love your instagram you've done some uh, thank you so really much really amazing work a lot of hard work goes into that and you should be thank proud so it looks much. lovely and the information the content that you share is great thank you so much yeah, yeah. well I am being mindful of our time and thank you so much for <laughs> my pleasure joining me today. Yeah, it was lovely chatting with you. It was lovely getting into this. And um, for all of our listeners, I will obviously link all of Sana's socials down below her website. Check her out. She has some really great content. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for coming on. And everyone just stay tuned for our disclaimer. The guest and the host at Brown People Problems do not offer individualized therapeutic or medical advice and our conversations should not be interpreted as such. This podcast is not a replacement for therapy. This podcast exists for educational purposes only. Please consider your circumstances and engage with the content mindfully.